Hello, everybody, to this week's uh, developer session. Uh, we don't have a big agenda or nothing, no big topic for this call, mainly also because some of the developers cannot join, like Christoph. And uh, Greg, I think, still has uh, health issues with his back, so he also cannot join. Uh, luckily, uh, Oscar could join today. Maybe uh, Bernard will join as well. Uh, but yeah, we keep it a little bit more open. Whatever you would like to discuss, we can uh, handle uh, and, and cover as well. I have a small agenda, as you have probably seen. I uh, would like to cover a little bit uh, the release. And there are a few important changes and a few important fixes, small stuff may, uh, maybe, but uh, good to know for everybody, I think. Uh, then I briefly discussed with Florian about options, how we could add integration tests for multiple operating systems to our build system. Maybe we can just brainstorm a little bit in this direction, but that would be good when Bernard uh, would be here, and maybe we cover it more in, deep, in depth when Bernard is available as well. Uh, yeah, um, related to this release, uh, pull request, uh, something about locking logging, uh, at least something that I was not really aware of and which is important to know, I think, for every developer. And when we still have time, I would like to um, yeah, to push out an idea for how we can improve altcoin trading. And maybe some developer who is not super occupied at the moment already with a topic, maybe like uh, Thomas uh, could yeah, could try to have a look to this and make a proposal about this and so on. But let's keep this at the end if, if there's still enough time. So <clears throat> I maybe I make a screen sharing with the pull requests uh, so we can have a look together <clears throat> over uh, yeah what, what has been uh, added to this release. And I'll give a quick overview and background uh, about the different topics. i make a screen sharing. One second. Do you see my? Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's the closed pull requests. Uh, I think there is none. Uh, no pull request open, which is planned to get in for the release. So by the way, we yeah we plan to have a new release either maybe today in the best. No, probably not today anymore. Uh, <clears throat> uh, probably tomorrow. And the main reason why we wanted to get out this release was uh, because I found a solution to solve this problem with not being able to spend unconfirmed change outputs from BSQ, which is a usability drawback. So when you made a BSQ transaction and you had only one uh, UTXO where all your BSQ were uh, sitting, <clears throat> then uh, you have to wait for one blockchain confirmation because BSQ is only verified when a block is created. Uh, we are not verifying unconfirmed transactions. And uh, that, yeah, when you want to create multiple proposals, for instance, you have to wait until the next block and so on. And especially for traders, it would be very bad when they want to use BSQ for paying the trading fee. And uh, yeah, when you create uh, one trade, then you, in the worst case, you have to wait for another block until your UTXO is uh, confirmed and you can spend it again. It would depend on your UTXO set. So when you have many uh, more, uh, UTXOs, then it's likely that you have other remaining UTXOs which you could uh, use. But it's confusing for the user. Sometimes he could do it, sometimes not. So it was a high priority to find a solution to make it possible to spend uh, your own change outputs, because that basically has no risk. You are not trying to cheat yourself with creating invalid BSQ transactions. Uh, so it can be considered as safe. I mean, when there would be, because of a bug or whatever, an invalid transaction, all this follow-up transaction will become invalid BSQ transactions as well. And so for the system, it doesn't create a problem. From usability, of course, it could then screw up quite a little bit, but that is not expected. <clears throat> we don't allow spending UT, uh, yeah, um, yeah, you take those which are unconfirmed, which you have received. So when I send you some BSQ, 
then you cannot spend this BSQ before uh, a blockchain confirmation. So we have not changed that. And uh, yeah, that was the main reason for this quick release. We had a, a really a big release uh, just two weeks ago. <clears throat> and usually we try to stick with a one month cycle for new releases, but we thought for DAO testing, it's a big improvement and it's probably confusing for people who are not so familiar yet with the, uh, with the BISC DAO. Uh, to understand the reasons why it is the case, and so that was the goal. Uh, over the last days, I got in touch with a power trader, a Monero trader, <coughs> who gave me very interesting feedback. Uh, he traded really a lot, and he had unfortunately quite a lot of cases of failed um, failed uh, taker, uh, also take off attempts. <coughs> So when he <clears throat> tried to take an offer, he got the timeout and lost the trading fees. And it was roughly 10% of all his trades are, uh, yeah, have been failed. And uh, I mean, we have this reimbursement, so uh, the, those users can ask for reimbursement on uh, GitHub uh, support repository. But it also, I think in the last one or two months, it was something like 10% of our revenue, which ended up in reimbursement for reimbursing people. So it, it became really a problem over the last months. And uh, the reason why this happens is not 100% clear yet. There, I suspect that it's uh, standby behavior <clears throat> on different operating systems and probably also on different uh, type or environment. So when you are, running on a laptop it uh, standby behavior might be different like when you run it on the same operating system but on a desktop computer at least i know it from os6 that it has changed over the last years uh, how the operating system handles uh, standby and in the more recent operating systems in os6 uh, you cannot prevent that your application gets throttled down the network uh, resources uh, whatever you uh, you define in your preferences, or uh, it doesn't matter. So after a while, <coughs> the network resources get very low, and that leads to the bad situation that your offer still managed to get uh, republished. So it's visible in the offer book. Then some taker try to take this offer, and in the take offer process, where you're exchanging the messages with the peer, your network resource is too low to respond in time and the other peer get the timeout and, uh, and lose the trading fee. For OS6, we seem to have fixed this uh, by playing an inauditable uh, sound, so a very silent sound, uh, is played in the background, and that prevents uh, <clears throat> the operating system to cut off your resources or to apply standby mode to your application. At least it seems that on OS6 that works, and it was tested, or that I think it was with the 09 release, uh, uh, introduced and we have seen that uh, we had less such cases but it seems that most of our users are windows users at the end and it seems that we still have issues on probably on other from these other operating systems uh, from this particular user i know that he was a windows user and yeah we need to investigate devin started a little bit to investigate this uh, issue we couldn't reproduce it so far but i assume it behaves different on your device so when you run it from a laptop i can assume that for saving uh, energy uh, the operating system behaves different uh, when the when the system is in standby mode so we need to go on to investigate to find solutions for this one possible solution would be to make sure that your offers get removed. So when you don't have sufficient network resources, then you remove your offer. Um, yeah, we have to discuss uh, what's the best strategy, how to deal with it. But um, so the underlying problem still is not solved, but because we probably cannot solve this uh, soon and quickly, I tried another solution, which is uh, that we are delaying the um the broadcasting of this uh, take a fee transaction just uh to the time before the taker is publishing the deposit transaction so in the trade protocol or uh, <clears throat> uh, like yeah like it was before the take a fee transaction was published then the taker sent a message to their 
maker, the maker is sending a message back and then the taker is publishing the deposit transaction. And when he never heard back from the maker, as in this last message when this was missing, then he got the timeout and the taker fee was already paid. There, there was some reason uh, for this, uh, for basically as a protection against data harvesting, because in this last message, the maker is exposing his uh, payment account data to the to the peer, and for fear trades that would yeah would is a problem for yeah, when some whatever chain on, uh, analysis companies want to uh, spy on BISC users, they could basically try to take all offers and then fail in the last moment, and by publishing the take a fee <coughs> transaction early, we try to. <coughs> Uh, yeah, we, we tried to add some costs to this. So when somebody wants to do this, uh, it becomes expensive at least. It's not a very strong protection. And it um, yeah, uh, at the end, uh, we also never managed to really make the uh, verification on the maker side uh, to only send the data when the fee is, uh, is uh, published. It would be problematic also because it's not, uh, we cannot wait until a confirmation. So it's a pending transaction and there's no guarantee that the maker will see the transaction in the network. So basically we we need to find a better conceptual solution as protection against this uh, potential threat. And at the moment it was just uh, <clears throat> causing more risk that uh, in such cases when the maker can do not respond in time with the last message that the taker lost the fee. And I just delayed it now, so the transaction is not committed to the wallet and not broadcast until the last moment, just before the deposit uh, transaction is created. And with that, basically, this problem with lost taker fees should go down to zero, I assume. There is still a tiny potential that in this last moment, there are two different tasks <coughs> in the trade protocol. <coughs> And when, for whatever reason, it would fail to publish their deposit transaction, then it would still be a problem. But there is no reason why this should happen. That maybe one in a million times. So uh, yeah, that was a very important um, feature which should increase usability because, of course, it's very annoying for users to ask them for reimbursement, and uh, many people don't know it. They just take it in. Um, yeah, take the lost fees. Usually, it's not really a lot the, the trading fee, but uh, it it decreases usability a lot. And uh, I'm happy that we could fix this now. So maybe I go over the list. Uh, I yeah, I just pushed another or we merged another pull request. We um, yeah, we had when I developed mainly for the peer to peer network. I added for verifying that all the messages are called or all the <coughs> the methods <coughs> and handlers are called in the right order at the right time. And so I added a, a trace lock uh, utility function in the static, uh, as in the lock class, the static method there. Uh, <coughs> and that was used yeah, a few years ago when, in, during development time. And since then, I left it just in case when for debugging or whatever. but. I at least I, I never enabled it as it was only enabled when you put lock level to trace. And uh, <coughs> Florian <coughs> did some performance tests uh, with the peer, uh, some profiling with peer to peer network and reported me that this are, those are quite expensive calls because they're not really part of the locking framework and not optimized uh, regarding the locking framework. So I just removed all those. And he he told me another um, important thing, which I was not really aware of, as I was aware that locking frameworks are built in the way when that when you have not enabled the locking level like debug, then your debug calls are super cheap and doesn't really cause performance issues. But there is one problem <coughs> when you use uh, a string a, a string. Uh, concatenation like uh, yeah, my variable and then and then the um, uh, co uh, quote plus and then the, the variable then it get evaluated by the compiler <coughs> as a string uh, evaluation and when you are when this variable what you are locking is expensive to create like we had a lot of 
where we locked the, the connection itself and then it's a connection to string and the connection is quite a big class so that's not a very cheap call then uh, all that uh, get executed even if you're not on that lock level so all this trace and debug locks which uh, used uh, the string co concatenation with plus or the variable to string concatenation with plus uh, were a problem from performance uh, point of view i fixed this now and so it should uh, may maybe some of you and hopefully most of you already know this i was not really aware that there is a performance difference uh, between that method and uh, the recommended method is that you use the curly brackets and <coughs> and the comma and then you can add uh, how, uh yeah whatever variables you want to add there and then uh, the the expression doesn't get uh, evaluated by the compiler and it's only evaluated when you are on the lock level uh, florian do you want to add something here or maybe make it a little bit more clear like my bad explanation oh no no that uh, basically that was correct what you said and i i, I added some some examples to the chat so i think okay that's, that's good enough Great. yeah <laughs> Uh, so yeah, basically we should care and we will uh, take care in the refuse for new pull requests that we don't allow, I mean, I try to clean up a little bit of the old stuff, uh, but it's still, of course, it's a, a longer task to clean up all the logging uh, that we are not using or yeah, that we're using the preferred method <coughs> and maybe also remove uh, the trace and debug messages. It's yeah because mostly they are not really needed and uh, it, uh, just uh, <clears throat> what else then yeah uh, I added another pull request yesterday for percentage based values for the security deposit some traders complained that uh, <clears throat> yeah it was a fixed amount so it it didn't uh, matter if you trade 20 uh, euro in bitcoin or if you trade um, 500 euro in bitcoin the security deposit for the buyer was a fixed amount in bitcoin the maker can define the security deposit and the main reason is to avoid kind of uh, option trading or future trading it's yeah when there is high volatility <coughs> and when you are the buyer and the price moves against your interest then you could decide to not send uh, the fiat or the altcoin and especially with altcoins in high yeah when when the prices are very volatile we get reported more uh, disputes from arbitrators that some users are abusing this basically and they yeah they prefer to lose the low security deposit instead of continuing the trade and have basically uh, more loss when they uh, continue the trade with the bad price for them and uh, it's cheaper than for them to make a new trade with a better price and to avoid this uh, we give it basically to the uh, to the maker uh, that the maker can define usually they know or uh, how volatile the market is uh, it's not the perfect solution and we want still to improve this that basically their security deposit will be derived from the volatility from the trade statistics but that's a little bit of, yeah that's another task for another release and a short solution now was to make it at least percentage based on the trade amount because uh, if you trade two bitcoin in monero or if you trade um, yeah, just a very tiny amount there should be a different um, uh, uh, yeah, different amount for the security deposit as well and yeah that's implemented now we also increased a little bit the default values <clears throat> because uh, it seems that um, yeah we get too many disputes where people are abusing this so hopefully with higher security deposits or uh, people stop uh, trying to cheat in a way the, uh, the trading protocol it's not really a cheating because it's part of the possibilities but it's not the intended behavior when you take a offer basically you have to fulfill the offer and this yeah uh, because we cannot force the buyer to make the payment of course he has the possibility to to cancel out in a way but it should be so expensive for him that usually he's not doing even if the price moves against his interest uh, so that should help us yeah because one of those feedbacks uh, which was very valuable from this trader is which is a pro trader 
uh, I wanted to find out yeah, what are the main issues for pro traders with the current BISC uh, um, yeah, implementation and what can we improve for them to make, uh, to make it more attractive. And one of the main thing was that he said, yeah, <clears throat> to have the funds uh, locked in very short time, the longer they have basically their Bitcoin or Monero locked in in a trade, the worse it is because yeah, they have only a certain amount of of uh, resources what they can have on on both uh, currencies to trade, and when seventy percent of those resources are locked in in trades, they cannot go on with trading. And that was the motivation to add another feature, uh, this one with the live trading. <clears throat> uh, live trading is maybe not really the live, uh, yeah, uh, was struggling with the right term. We call it now instant trading. Uh, it's at the moment only for altcoins. Uh, so when you create an altcoin account, there is a new checkbook where you can enable instant trading. And with that, the trade period is limited to one hour. <clears throat> so you have to fulfill both traders have to fulfill this trade in one hour. So only both can trade when both have set up such an account. So you need basically two accounts uh, when you sometimes prefer to do fast trading and sometimes the normal trading. And um, <clears throat> so you cannot mix uh, when you have set up a normal <clears throat> Monero account. You cannot trade with uh, a maker who has created a offer for instant trading. You need to create a new uh, account for this instant trading and then when you take this offer you have to ensure that you are physically online and you can fulfill the trade in one hour. One hour is required, we cannot go much shorter because especially with Monero, <coughs> you in Monero they have a similar problem that you cannot spend unconfirmed transaction outputs or I think it's, I cannot explain it exactly uh, what's uh, um, the, the other technical backgrounds and so, but it can easily happen when you are sending some Monero out that you are blocked for uh, <clears throat> for a few blocks until your um, UTXOs are returned to your wallet and you and spendable because of you have the ring uh, of the ring signatures so there in a few, in several rounds and in this time uh, you cannot you cannot use them. <clears throat> so in the worst case, uh, it takes. Uh, yeah, half an hour or whatever, uh, what the Monero user has to wait until he can again spend their money. And of course, when they do many, many live trading in parallel, they would get to the same problem. They have to be aware how much they can handle <coughs> either by using <coughs> different Monero wallets or whatever to avoid these problems. Uh, yeah, what else? Yeah, I, I skipped the ones which are not very relevant. There are uh, many, many smaller pull requests. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Florian found luckily uh, ver one very important and long uh, existing memory leak, uh, which was mainly visible only on the seed nodes, I never could see it on normal applications on OS X or also from users, it was not really reported. Uh, <clears throat> in the connection class, <clears throat> yeah, there was a, a tiny, small, stupid missing line, basically, where yeah, we were collecting for checking how much uh, messages uh, you are handling. We were collecting those, and when you had, uh, yeah, when you received too many messages, then you stopped uh, as when on the receiver side. <clears throat> so when a peer was sending you too many messages, you disconnect him. And when you send out yourself too many messages, you are throttling down and yeah, call some sleep on a thread in between. And there was a list which were collecting <clears throat> all these messages over time with timestamps. And this list was not uh, correctly cleaned up when it was hitting a limit. So we were only collecting, I think, 2,000 messages there uh, and then starting to uh, to delete old messages. And there was a uh, yeah, missing while loop to de delete really all messages and not only the last one or the first one. And that should fix basically the main issue on seed notes that uh, memory was growing on seed note. We still are in the process to check and verify if it's was the only issue or not, uh, but at least it was for sure one of the major issues. 
So I'm happy that uh, we could get this solved. Uh, <clears throat> there are a few other tiny uh, other improvements in that area, especially also with the locking and so, and some other small improvements in the peer-to-peer -peer network, which, yeah, so that was another finding uh, uh, with feedback from this use and also from other, a little bit investigation. We, s we have seen that we uh, we got a little bit more lost peer-to-peer -peer network messages. Uh, users are reporting that their disputes uh, <clears throat> yeah, were not handled also because they are probably the open dispute message never arrived at the arbitrator or trade messages uh, didn't arrive. And it's probably caused because the peer-to-peer -peer network get too crowded already. We have m many more users like in the past and the republishing of the offer <clears throat> so when you have an offer live every five minutes you send a re uh, refresh message out to the network which is a very lightweight message it doesn't contain the full offer only the minimum data to prove that you are the owner of the offer and then the time to live as so every offer um, has a time to live in the peer-to-peer -peer network so when the uh, when the maker would lose network connection or kill his application without without a, a planned shutdown, a graceful shutdown, <clears throat> then uh, the offer get removed after the time to live has expired from every peer. And this time to live, I think it was seven minutes, and the refresh mess uh, refresh interval was five minutes. And it seemed that this two minute in between was not enough. Sometimes the refresh message don't arrive at all peers and then uh, your offer got removed. And we got this report also from this one trader that he has observed that his own offers was uh, removed even if he was online and was good connected. But it was probably because the refresh message didn't arrive at all peers. So I changed this uh, parameters for the refresh and for the uh, time to live increase both uh, the refresh to reduce a little bit the network load and the time to live to make it less likely that um, you get in this problem zone that um, yeah, you didn't receive the refresh message in time. I think that probably will not really fix a lot. It should be just a tiny or small improvement. Uh, <clears throat> we will look into a better fix uh, by batching those messages as when you as a peer receive hundreds of messages uh, we have seen that more or less there are 300 uh, refresh uh, refresh offer messages per minute that's something like uh, five messages per second which is quite a lot <clears throat> and we try we will try to find a solution for batching all these messages and pack it to one message which will be broadcast to the other peers so you are not sending out then, uh, in the worst case, something like 20 or 100 messages per second, uh, but only one message which contains then all these messages, but you have uh, received in a certain time frame. But that's a little bit more complex, and uh, yeah, we'll discuss with Florian how to do this and uh, when we'll be ready, but that should improve a lot this um, network congestion issues and should make the peer-to-peer -peer network more reliable again. Then another important feature is in the API branch, as the API branch is still <coughs> uh, separate from the master and it's still not ready for production, but I think we're getting closer now because a very imp two important features have been implemented from Bernard. One is a yeah, security framework for um, password protection with a token for the API. So <coughs> all the calls for the API require a token and you have to uh, provide your password to, to the API to receive the token. And then the second one, uh, the connection to the API uh, will be only supported over Tor, hidden services. We were uh, <coughs> considering also to use HTTPS, but it would have uh, had the problem that uh, you need to uh, set up Let's Encrypt to get the certificate and uh, <coughs> you Cannot, can only do this when you have a domain. So many people will run it just with an IP address without the domain, and then you have a problem to get the HTTPS uh, support for this. And HTTPS is also based on a centralized system, basically, so I'm not so super great fan of it. I mean, it would have been good enough, 
but uh, the main reason was yeah, there's <coughs> this limitation that you need a domain and need to set up let's encrypt and so and <coughs> tor is solving all these problems and deliver much more uh, features and only comes with the extra cost that it costs more performance which is not a problem with api uh, we don't have yeah we don't have a performance issue there that you are calling your api with thousand requests per second or whatever so he has implemented this um, and it's actually a quite an interesting way how it's implemented it doesn't use uh, a socket in java it just call the net layer library that it create, creates a new hidden service which is only used for the api so it's completely separate from the normal bisc application and it proxies to the port to the local port of the api <coughs> so it it doesn't uh, start anything in java it doesn't go like our uh, tour uh, framework uh, yeah, the way how we use it uh, we are starting a socket and this socket is basically our local proxy in the application uh, for the api not even that happens so i think from performance uh, point of view it's very very cheap it's really done purely from the tour binary and proxying uh, a hidden service to the local port. So I think that's quite a cool uh, implementation. And from my point of view, I think the API would be basically ready now for production. I mean, there are there the features which are implemented are not very usable for. I think it's only get get a version and another trivial uh, feature but that was intentional to have basically all the basics really in place and solved and then start to implement their features but uh, bernard is working on this and maybe in the best case with the next release we can release publicly the api i would like to <coughs> release it or to to have an extra module desktop with API, also the API, API can be run as a headless uh, version and uh, in their desktop, <clears throat> similar like in Bitcoin Core, you can, uh, with the internal terminal, you can um, yeah, use the, the API and the RPC API, even if you run a desktop. Uh, so you can run your BISC <clears throat> application as desktop and uh, have your API server running as well and get connected uh, from the api side as well but to reduce because the api yeah it's a different project in a way and we want to be very uh, <clears throat> very careful with security risks to not uh, expose all bisc users to potential issues uh, from the api side i prefer to have two binaries the normal desktop binary which doesn't include anything from the api and the second binary desktop plus api <coughs> where those users who want to take uh, advantage of this feature to have the desktop plus the api in one application they can install and run this but if we would find out uh, some security vulnerability it would be limited to uh, much less users and the potential damage would be much less critical um it's a little bit of pain because yeah we need to uh we have an extra uh, application build so the build takes a little bit long and so on uh maybe we can find some kind of like smart uh solution that by default you are not compiling this extra application only for the uh, for the release manager who's doing the release he will then compile this or whatever uh we have to discuss when we get closer to this. <coughs> I'm just looking if there's anything else. Yeah, I think we cover probably most of the important features. So I stop the screen sharing here. Um, do anybody of you have some questions or want to discuss or add something regarding releases and uh, technical stuff which what has happened in the last two weeks? If not, then I go on. Uh, yeah, I started to discuss a little bit with Florian just before the call. Uh, possibilities uh, to 
at integration testing, especially for different operating systems in our build system. So when you make yeah, when we are yeah, when you make a pull request, it gets tested on Windows, on Linux, on OS six, and so on automatically. Uh, it's for sure not the easy task, and I would postpone this uh, when Bernard is available as well, because he has a lot of experience with integration tests with the API and so. Uh, I doubt that Travis in the free version, like we are using it at the moment, will support this because I think it uh, will consume much more resources. So probably we need to start to run our own integration test server and uh, handle this. Uh, I'm not familiar with this at all, but maybe Devin can help in that area if that will be the way to go. Um, yeah, because the main issue is that most developers only are developing and only have available one operating system. Even if you have, like myself or Christoph, you have some VMs with uh, other operating systems, it's kind of like painful to start this VMs. It's super slow. In, and at the end, it always behaves a little bit different, especially when you want to test some more complex stuff like the, uh, <clears throat> like at the moment this issue with the standby mode. I mean, that's, of course, it cannot also be done by integration tests, but it's limited with a VM. It's not really the same. And to have a little bit more realistic system uh, would be good. I mean, of course, this integration test will also be limited, not really the real stuff, but at least it will help us to spot potential issues on different operating systems. Luckily, we, we don't have many issues. I mean, one of the very few have been this issue with the seed node um, restore problem. It seems that we still have some issues. We got some bug reports, and it seems that the users have used the latest version. I'm not 100% sure yet. <clears throat> I have not investigated closely. But I think we have to look closer and test more in depth if the restore function with seed node really works 100%, especially on Windows, because it's a very critical issue, of course, when when a user <coughs> would uh, would have uh, backup his uh, seed node and uh, need it because he has a, a hard disk crash or whatever, and then it's not working. When it's only not working on Windows and we can uh, <coughs> get it working on other operating system, it's not terrible. Uh, problematic because at least he can recover then with help from somebody else, but it's still, of course, very annoying for the user and uh, and uh, it's yeah, it's bad for the reputation of BISC when such a critical part is not really working 100% safe. Should put this a little bit on the our priority. <clears throat> so maybe uh, Oscar, if you has have time, maybe you can. I don't want to interrupt your plans at the moment. I know uh, with the um, with the Bitcoin J. Uh, branch and release stuff. I think we should continue and close this, but we have we can have a private uh, discussion about this. But basically, I think we should put this a little bit in focus that uh, we are solving this issue. And other issues are with Tor starting. Yeah, Manfred, please, if you have any lead on the bug on this, I shall send it to me so I can have a look. Yeah, I will assign it on GitHub. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and we can have a discussion anyway when you have time uh, in private to talk a little bit about the roadmap and so. Uh, <clears throat> another issue what we have spotted over the last um, weeks a little bit more, like in the past, uh, from my point of view, is our startup issues with Tor. It's either that you cannot get it started at all, <clears throat> and it seems that there are some issues, and I experienced this myself last year, that suddenly I couldn't connect to Tor anymore with different new onion addresses and so on. So it seems that either the my internet provider was blocking Tor uh, or my IP address, which, which was a static one and I couldn't change, unfortunately, was blocked and flagged as for DDoS purposes or whatever uh, <coughs> by the Tor network. We don't know much about how it works exactly, the DDoS protection Tor, but for sure they will have something. And especially for developers who are, yeah, who are testing a lot and so, uh, there could be some kind of false positives that you get flagged at some point of time that uh, Tor Network thinks that you are spamming their Tor Network and then you, your IP address gets blacklisted or whatever. Uh, have not, I researched it a few times and have not found really anything concretely, but it could be intentional that the Tor Network keep this area a little bit more secret to not make it easy for attackers to find their, the way around these uh, protections. So 
uh, for me, the solution was to use VPN and then it was working again. <clears throat> and so that's also for some users who might have this problem. They could try either to start over with a new online address. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they lose their local reputation when you do this. But yeah, that's one potential solution. I mean, the first solution is to just clean up your tour directory, delete, or you can do it in the application, delete all the files, excluding their hidden service uh, private key that you must not uh, delete, of course. And sometimes this helps. Or uh, on Windows, it seems there's still maybe some issues with some locked files or whatever. Uh, and the next point would be to uh, try to start over with a new hidden service. And I've seen this also in the past. Sometimes I had problems that one hidden service didn't work. And when I created a new one, everything was fine again. And yeah, it seems that sometimes some onion addresses also get kind of like flagged or whatever, come with some problems. I don't know exactly why. And when all that doesn't work, then using VPN is probably the only last solution or using uh, <clears throat> plugin transports transport in Tor, but then it's probably more related that you're living in a country where uh, Tor is blocked, like in China or Iran or so. But I think, yeah, this uh, Tor issues, we should also put on our high priority list to get this solved, uh, because it seems that there are a little bit too many reports. I mean, we never get everything perfect, and when there's one report every two months or so, I don't care really but when there are five reports per month because every user who re for every user who reports we have 10 other in the uh in the silence who are not reporting and uh, so we should take it care uh, take it serious when we get repeated reports uh, about some issues uh what else yeah the locking performance issue i already covered before so we really have to take care to not use string or variable concatenation with plus uh, only use the, yeah, the the comma with the brackets syntax and yeah do you have anything else you want to discuss or add to the topics i covered yeah personally for me it it's great that uh, automatic testing is moving on because um, from my perspective of working on Bitcoin chain, like everything, every, every time I had to do a change, it was really scary. So if we add more unit tests or integration tests, I think uh, it will be great. Yeah, I yeah, completely agree. It's just not trivial and a lot of effort. That's the reason why they don't exist yet. But luckily, uh, um, Bernard has already done a lot of this work on the API side. So with the API, <clears throat> I have never looked very close to um, what's covered exactly and how everything works. But I think uh, with the API, <clears throat> we will get already quite uh, good uh, coverage for, from integration tests because yeah, he has, he has, uh, he's covering a lot of use cases like yeah, doing all the trade process and so on. And um, as many of the features which will not be enabled as in the API, when we release the API, we will have a, a program argument flag uh, allow or disallow experimental features. <clears throat> and by default, also when it's called allow experimental features, by default it's false. So a normal user who will use the API only get enabled those features which are really well tested and reviewed. Uh, <clears throat> And for integration tests, you need all the stuff what he has already integrated. So basically, yeah, big, big, a big scope of the uh, BISC features, what you can do in the UI, you can do already on the API as well. But it will take much more time to get that already production ready and reviewed and tested well. Uh, and to, to not be blocked too long, we basically go on with one feature after the other from starting from the most important for basically creating offers and doing a trade and then getting further and further to create a payment account to make a, a Bitcoin transaction and so on. And um, yeah, for the user perspective, those features will come over time and will take a few months until the full scope will be available for users 
who are not willing to take the risk to uh, allow this uh, experimental features. <coughs> but for <coughs> testing purpose, we can use this, of course, because that doesn't really matter. And yeah, I maybe we have one special session where Bernard gives a little bit more overview about this integration test, what's how it works, and yeah, I explain it all, all more in detail. Regarding um, yeah, with the Bitcoin J, maybe I give a little bit of overview. <coughs> uh, the yeah, there's a new release um, done now uh, with uh, Segwit support. So that's a huge release, which took two years or so. So it's uh, not very back. Oh yeah, it's completely different to the latest release to the 0.14. Uh, <coughs> what uh, we are using, so it will be a big effort for us to move over to the new release. But it's basically on our roadmap for the next uh, few months. The current roadmap is that we get, uh, as we are using the 0.14.4 release, and then there was a little bit of newer release, the 14.7, <coughs> and Oscar has uh, yeah, uh, updated all the code to the 14.7. So basically, that should be, I think it's already a pull request, which is ready for uh, review and merge for the probably for the next release now. I just didn't want to get it in into that release because I wanted to keep risks and uh, testing effort low. Uh, but probably for the next release, we will basically update to this 14.7 release, uh, which doesn't really have a lot of changes or whatever. So it's not a big uh, change for the user or whatever. Uh, but then um, a big task will be to really test well the Bitcoin uh, J master release. So maybe we create our own BISC branch for this. I'm not 100% sure how to deal with it. Uh, but it would be good basically when developers would work on this. <coughs> but we don't have it in master as long we are not very confident that there are no bugs there. <coughs> uh, Bitcoin J, yeah, uh, we don't want to be there the first alpha testers who run into production bugs uh, by going too quickly into uh, master. And we don't need the features, really. I mean, we don't hardly need SegWit at the moment. So it would be, of course, nice to have many people request it more for political and principal reasons. And myself, of course, I'm also a big fan of SegWit. But technically, we don't need it. And uh, it's not used in the trade protocol and so on. And it will be for sure because of many API changes. It will take some time to adopt all the BISC code for the, uh, for this master release. And also then to add the new possibilities with Segwit and so on. So I assume that take minimum one month's work and then probably another month for intensive uh, testing and so on. So I assume maybe a realistic time scope in two or three months that we could get uh, up Dated to uh, Bitcoin J Master with Segwit support. And yeah, do you have anything to add, uh, Oscar, from that area? Um, well, that uh, one of the things that uh, we should decide or well, that we can think about is uh, um, like the. the um, Having SegWit support, meaning that you you could have like a, a SegWit addresses. Um, like if, if you want to have also backwards compatibility, meaning that you could uh, receive funds from wallets that cannot send to, to BESH uh, 30, 32 addresses. Uh, we should have like two, like uh, be, we should, enable users to have like two addresses one is the old address and the other is the like the new uh, segwit addresses um so th we should like uh, think more about that so discuss that with andrea shibla of bitcoin J. um so that that will be like a challenge when implementing um yeah bitcoin J 15. But I'm not sure if I understand correctly. So I didn't have planned that we are moving uh, only or to uh, back uh, 32 addresses only. <clears throat> so basically, we should support both addresses. Or uh, when you yeah that you can send to 
classical Bitcoin addresses and to the new address format. And when you receive fund, uh, <clears throat> yeah, in the UI, of course, we need to <clears throat> to have uh, some changes to that the user can de decide. When you want the receive address, you can decide yeah, if you want a, a, a classical address or a new back uh, 32 address. Um, but that, and of course, I'm not sure in the trade protocol how exactly to deal with it because you can fund your uh, required funds at the moment only with classical addresses and so on. So I would do it basically in in steps and start only with the minimum uh, that you can that we support back uh, 32 addresses for sending and receiving, but not using it in the trade protocol because I think it doesn't really add any any big benefit technically or I mean it's only basically this kind of like secret support mentality which is more a political thing and I'm also not so 100% sure and there are some people like uh, Luke Dash uh, JR <coughs> who are against using uh, back uh, or segwit transaction when you don't need it for a lightning or so because basically they are get counted in this additional clock space uh, <coughs> and basically create help to create bigger blocks. So when more and more people are using uh, Segwick uh, addresses, it leads to factually bigger blocks. I mean, of course, the block size is still the one megabyte, but this additional block space, which is handled differently, is in reality, of course, you need, when you're full node, you need to download this data as well, and it uh, costs you more resources. And for those people who are in the camp, for, like Luke uh, Dash JR, who want even smaller blocks and are very concerned about the block size growth <clears throat> and resource consumption, I think they have some good arguments to try to not overuse the new address format when when you don't have a real need for it. And this good intention to basically push SegWit and so might be at the end not really and in so good results when you think a little bit further in this. I have not thought and discussed much in that direction. I am I just found it interesting when I saw these comments from Luke uh, Dash Chair because I was not aware of myself earlier. And people like Vasa uh, the uh, Nopara 73 from Wasabi Wallet, uh, who push a lot to SegWit only. I have not discussed with him, and uh, I don't know exactly uh, the background but i'm a little bit skeptical if that really is such a good idea and if basically if for instance when we can choose uh, to use only segwick transactions in the trade protocol or not if it's a good idea or not because we don't need the features from i mean transaction malleability is a theoretical issue in bisc as well but it's not a practical issue and um yeah, that, but that's maybe for future discussions. But I would say in the beginning, the goal is only to make it available for sending and receiving. Some people are complaining that you cannot send uh, from Wasabi Wallet, for instance, you cannot send uh, funds to BISC. And uh, the Wasabi developer were even trying to help uh, projects who are not on Segwit yet to, uh, uh, to implement it and so on. But I think that's now obsolete because Bitcoin J is now ready and yeah, they are not Java developers, so probably they are not really, they cannot help so much. But of course, it's great that they offer this help. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit my point of view on this, but we can have uh, maybe a, our self discussions or then when we get more closely to this, have more broad discussion about the strategy, how we support it and what we support and the roadmap for that. Okay. I'm not very familiar. <clears throat> I, yeah, with this, there's some complexity of different backward compatibility with addresses and so on. I have not really followed it close, and maybe you'll give me a little bit of uh, update about this before we are um, yeah, discussing this uh, closer. But there's some complexity included in this topic with SegWit addresses and transactions and so on that, um, yeah. And I think also from the wallet side, I think there were some issues that with the HD wallet, there was so, some non-trivial complexities uh, included. Uh, well, yeah, basically, in, I mean, I think most of the Bitcoin J, um, most of the applications that use Bitcoin J, like us, they will have to like uh, 
not use the default wallet, which will just create like just segwit addresses. Uh, we will have to like um, create two keychains inside the wallet to have both segwit addresses and all addresses. Because if we don't, we won't be able to to provide users with um, legacy addresses, uh, and we should be able to do that because uh, there are still wallets that uh, don't have a segwit implemented and those wallets won't be able to fund this queue. So we need to be able to support both. Um, but that's it. So basically, you cannot use the same private key from your wallet for the legacy address and for the new address, or because probably Bitcoin J cannot handle it, then probably to separate or to merge them together as when, you, when you're spending funds. <clears throat> uh from from a legacy address you cannot use the private key of this um address uh for <clears throat> sending it with a uh in in a, in a segwit transaction or or the other way around also you cannot mix it in when you have uh only one uh keychain and you have basically for yeah uh one private key you cannot use this private key for both the legacy address and for the back uh, 32 address. Is this correct? Well, the private key are not shared. What is shared is the seed words, uh, but there are two derivation paths for, um, for segwit and for non-segwit. OK, so we will have basically a similar system like with uh, PSQ that we have same seed word root, but we have a different branch of the HD wallet. Exactly, yes. And that's how well is this already supported from the Bitcoin Chase Hub? Because actually that's, we have a few tiny issues in with this concept because it was basically, Bitcoin Chain was not developed for multi-wallet usage. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> one issue what SQ discovered, it happens basically when you send Bitcoin from your BISC wallet to a BSQ address by just removing the B, the prefix, you can do this. Then you screw up your wallet. I mean, it's not the intended and not the normal use case, so we ignore it at the moment. But it should be fixed one day, but it's not trivial to fix because it goes very deep in the architecture how uh, Bitcoin Chase is handling the wallets and sharing data. And But when they have i think bitcoin j have to support both uh address formats to be able to support uh, their the legacy addresses as well <clears throat> because i think that's a required use case for many wallets at least one or two years and when they have this requirement i think then they have to work on this fix as well to yeah in regarding this problem but we have run into it to support basically uh multiple uh branches in the or multiple wallets or in a better way like it is at the moment is correct yes i can imagine there are there will be some issues when using both legacy addresses and segwit addresses on bitcoin j because i kind of feel that andreas was not so interested in that use case uh so probably probably there are some bugs that uh, he didn't foresee uh, and for for instance i'm not sure if you can spend uh funds that you have on segwit addresses and non-segwit addresses on the same transaction using the same using the the the, the provided coin selector uh, so th there are still some unknowns yeah so when it's the same constellation like with psq we, we are doing this all the time that we are creating one transaction which mix the bitcoin wallet inputs and psq inputs so that works without the problem the only problem is <clears throat> when you are sending from uh yeah from one actually it's also because we can send from psq bitcoin to the bitcoin wallet and i have not seen any issues with that so far um, so when, for instance, when you make a compensation request and you get rejected, then there, 
yeah, the reserved funds, which should have become BSQ, are then a dedicated Bitcoin. <clears throat> and in your in your BSQ wallet, you can send this to your Bitcoin wallet. And that's basically just a transaction where you send some Satoshis from your BSQ wallet to your Bitcoin wallet, and that works without problem. And the problem what the SQ had <clears throat> was when you were sending some Bitcoin from the Bitcoin wallet to the BSQ wallet. And I'm not sure why in that direction we have the problem, in the other direction not that's not very logically. So we have to look close into it. Um, not, maybe I shouldn't get lost too much in such details. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, well, I, I think that the, the big, uh, I mean, the, the important comment is that there will be some testing before we fully use Bitcoin J15. Yeah, I think we need very intense testing and especially very good developer testing that before a longer release uh, that uh, all the developers are using this already for locally when, when they are testing and so on so that we have enough time to spot any issues. Uh, anything else uh, anybody want to discuss? I I mean, the last topic, what I wanted to cover regarding this uh, ideas for altcoin trade improvements, maybe I postponed for another call because it was mainly, I would like to have Thomas uh, in a call then as well, because he might be a potential developer who could work on this and to not uh, repeat it and yeah, to talk directly with him uh, might make more sense and it's already late, it's already one hour. So maybe we wrap up here if you don't want to add anything. Or... Hello, Devin, uh, did you want to add anything? We don't no, hear no, you. No, sorry, maybe. I'm good. Okay, yeah. Okay, then, uh, thanks for joining, and see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.